This time we turn the tables. We've got a guest who's created a number of podcasts, but has not been interviewed before. So, welcome, Mark Jorgensen. <laughs> How's it going? Thanks for having me on, Stefan. It's an honor. Oh, fantastic. And uh, you know, I got to uh, uh, corresponding with you when you approached me about the Island Travel podcast and wanted some feedback on the, the logos and, and topics. And, and I thought back to my own travels. I'm from the U.S., big country. I'm not really a beach person, so I had dismissed islands quite a bit. Uh, but then in my travels, some of my favorite places, uh, Prince Edward Island, as, as an example, became a, some of my favorite destinations in the world, and I began seeking out some of the, the very remote ones. So I'm curious your, your island story. Well, it, it goes back pretty far. I, I don't know how detailed you want the short version or not. The, the short version is... Um, I just found that islands seem to be these places that people like uh, to be, but uh, and and very popular. Um, but I, I guess it was I grew up in Seattle on the west coast of the United States, and um, the popular, you know, island to go to was Hawaii. Growing up, I grew up in the '80s and '90s, and um, you know, the Caribbean I think was more popular. I think with people, if you grew up on the East Coast, you probably you know the Caribbean destinations seem to be more popular. Um, and so I can uh, certainly, because <laughs> I moved from New York uh, three years ago to Seattle, and it's like the Caribbean ceased to exist. And <laughs> oh, really? Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I guess it was. I, I did an internship in New York in 2007 when I was kind of just leaving college, getting out of college, and I, I would notice on the subway all these um, ads for like Bahamas and, and um, Jamaica and other oh, places. Atlas travel, right? <laughs> I saw the ads too. <laughs> Everywhere, the red ads. <laughs> There was this one called like when I was there called the Bahama Vention or ah. Bahama Vention. Maybe you remember like in 2006, 2007, and um, people would complain because in the dead of winter of New York, it's like those ads would just be like screaming at you, like you know, what are you doing here? <laughs> the climate, you know, and office climate in New York, people would just be kind of like, oh, those Bahama Vention ads are just they're just killing me. I hate, yeah. I hate staring at them. So it, it was it was. As, as I got, got more familiar with travel, I, I wasn't a big tra traveler going up. I mean, my I, I didn't do a lot of family travel. I, I I went to Brazil when I was 19. But other than that, I really didn't go outside the United States until I was like 24, 25, when I went to the UK and London. And um, then I worked for an airline um, in my kind of my first job out of college. And um, it was it was U.S. Airways before it merged into American Airlines. So it was... Um, it, it, it was kind of eye-opening to me because I saw, and as I started to travel like to Korea, uh, one of the places I went in Asia, um, Jeju Island mm. uh, is a big, and, and I, you've been there, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's, uh, I guess for aviation buffs, that's usually tops the list of busiest air routes sold to Jeju Island, right? I, I, I didn't know that. I, I, I think maybe you mentioned that before when I was speaking with you, but um, yeah. It's so, but I noticed in grocery stores or in like just regular places. And when I was in Seoul, Korea, um, I, I'd heard of Jeju, but I, I knew it was kind of a popular place. But I would see the ads mm. uh, for Jeju Island, and it reminded me of like, oh, like that's basically like Hawaii or the Caribbean, mm -hmm. United States. It, it's a very similar demographic. They're trying to appeal to people's, you know, that kind of. Um, not so much wanderlust, but that, you know, getting away from like the frantic, you know, busy life of your, you know, whatever city life or suburban life of, mm -hmm. and just trying to kind of get away. And um, so, so as I saw that and I started to realize, you know, like in Europe, there's, you know, the Mediterranean is loaded with these, you know, Ibiza is like another popular place. There's, you know, Sicily, there's, you know, countless islands in Greece and throughout the Mediterranean. And I just started to realize that like all over throughout the world, islands, tend to be where people like to go on vacation. And, and why is that, right? It just made me, it just made me think, because every place seems to have this pattern of getting away, especially if you're going from a cold winter climate to a warm summer climate or, or a warm climate. And so uh, anyways, I, last year though, I, I, I took kind of a six month trip around the world and um, I ended up spending a good deal of time in um, Florianopolis, Brazil, which is a beautiful island, Santa Catarina, Southern Brazil. Um, amazing, just attracts all kinds of people, uh, outdoor life, you know, beach life, um, surfing, but also just all kinds of stuff. And um, Taiwan was another place I spent, you know, a while. 
and Bali was another one, which I mean, these are kind of all popular places, but um, Sri Lanka was another one. There, there, there's, there's just islands. They tend to be these places that people want to go to get away from things a little bit. And um, I, I just, in summary, I, during COVID, I, I kind of had this idea for, you know, COVID project was like, well, why are, what makes islands so special? And, you know, the idea that a previous podcast I did was about all kinds of different things. Why not just do a podcast episode where it's just very focused on one island, 15, 20 minutes, mm -hmm. you know, what makes this island cool? And uh, many of them are places I haven't been to, I hope you go to. Um, some of them are places that, you know, um, people know well, but some of them are very obscure, kind of hard to get to places. Like the episode I think I did with you was, um, what was Christmas Island, Australia, which is a pretty tough to get to place from yeah. from many, you know, unless you're, I guess, from Western Australia or maybe from Indonesia. I mean, everywhere else is pretty tough. Even, to get to. even that, I mean, it's like you got to be determined. If you're in Indonesia, there's you know like a, a a twenty dollar flight to some magical beach destination, or there's a you know an eight or eight hundred or thousand dollar flight to get to Christmas Island. So you really you really got to want it then. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you, you got to want it. But I, I didn't, I didn't know about it before. But I talked to you, and like, I just kind of fell, fell. I, I, I don't know. I, I just really started to like the idea of it, and and it, you know, the red crabs. And I started looking at the pictures of those crabs, like these huge crabs, and just that red crab migration. It just, I, I think you said in the episode, you're like, you show pictures to that to anyone, or you point to a BBC documentary or something, and they will be mesmerized. Yeah, and, and I was, I was kind of mesmerized. Um, you know, you got that. Um, Gunnar Garfors, he's another one. Maybe he's known here in oh, every part. Right. Of camp. Um, he, he did the island of Kiribati, mm -hmm. a, a place that I knew I did not know how to pronounce correctly. I just mm -hmm. I, I thought it was Kiribati, like mm -hmm. probably many people <laughs> mispronounce. But um, yeah, he, he, he and we spent some time there for I can I think his second book. And uh, wow, what 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 a magical kind of place. That's tough to get to, but but also I, I did Manhattan, which I'm sure many people probably listening to this, if, you know, probably most people have been to Manhattan or are very familiar with it. And um, and we just, I, I talked to a guy that walked every street in Manhattan over a couple year period with his wife. And um, wow, that was, that was just a great one, a high energy kind of, you know, very commonplace. Um, islands just, they, they, they have certain aspects to them that, that, that keep them separated. And, and a lot of commerce is focused there throughout the world. Um, Historically, I mean, the island of Paris, you know, I think Paris began around that. Um, I forget the name of it now, but that, that where, where kind of the Notre Dame Cathedral was, that was an island in the middle of the, um, the river, the, the Seine River. And so uh, anyways, I just think islands have so much to offer and that they, they say there's reasons that they exist um, like they do. And uh, um, well, yeah, I've, I've done only about 10 episodes so far, um, but it's, it's just been fascinating. And every there hasn't been an island that I don't want to go to that I've heard about that, that I've done an episode with so far. Um, yeah, yeah, did a great one on Cuba too. So, anyways, sorry. Yeah, I, I love the uh, that tour free you launched with. I mean, something very obscure, Christmas Island, and then who was expecting Manhattan to be the next episode? And uh, <laughs> I, I, I lived there for some years. I never, I, I walked a ton, but I never did the full up. I mean, you know, <laughs> the extent that your guest knows the island, and it's it, it is. Uh, uh, you know, taking that as perspective. I mean, it, it, it is an island and that shapes so much of, of what it is. And I'd often encourage visitors, I, I later lived in Jersey City, i say, if you're visiting New York as a tourist, consider staying in, in Brooklyn or Jersey City, because if the point is to see Manhattan, then, you know, stay in a hotel where you're looking at Manhattan instead of looking at New Jersey, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and get a sense of the place and the ferries and, and that, this, uh, uh, you know the, the, this experience, and yeah, there's why why out of all places in the U.S. did that make sense? The geography, so much of it made sense to to build this economic power. Yeah, 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 and, and I think the the way settlement kind of works, it's um, you know historically defensive um, aspects of cities is, is such a big part of what makes a city survive. Is how easy is it to protect? Mm -hmm. And islands kind of have a natural barrier to them, and so. Um, you know, it, it shapes a lot in how places develop. Um, now, I mean, that being said, I mean, you, you know, you need, um, you need to feed people. So you have to have access to a larger area where you can produce food. Um, so islands are great for commerce and trade and all that, but they can't always produce enough um, for the people living on them. And, and obviously you need other ways. So it, 
you know, I'm, I'm not a geography or geographer or historian enough to know all these things, but I'm just, just traveling around. It finds, you see different patterns and, um, yeah, I find it fascinating from that that aspect too of why I make what makes islands special and, and all also just as a vacation, you know, mm -hmm. just I like sitting on the beach too. So just chilling. <laughs> Favorite beach. <laughs> the, the the easy Instagram question, hard to answer. <laughs> Favorite like, beach that you've been to. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean I I, I mean I, I grew up in Seattle mm -hmm. and um I, I guess I didn't really know what beaches were like in the tropical areas until I was much older. Um and I, I guess one of my pet projects that I, I guess I, I hope to get the ideas. Um, I, I spent a considerable amount of time in Brazil, mm. and uh, Ilha Grande. It's like um, the big island in Rio de Janeiro. It's a um, ton of backpackers. It's it's a, a great island to go to. It, it used to be like a prison um, mm. decades ago, but they turned it into this kind of a beach resort. It was also where they had um, Im immigration would come in to Brazil and they would keep people there for like uh, medical testing and that kind of thing. But anyway, it's just a resort now and um, it, it's a great place. But um, all the beaches along Brazil, um, you, you know, I, I, I wasn't very sophisticated and probably many people growing up in the United States aren't very sophisticated about beaches, about what beaches offer. So it's like, you know, there's, in Brazil, people, they, Brazilians just kind of know it's like you have sand, um, what the waves are like, what kind of activities you can do in the water. Um, is it private, you know, or is it isolated? Is it, you know, full of people? So it's like mm. people watching versus just, you know, privacy and just having a beach to yourself. Um, security, um, access by roads, um, you know, how accessible is it? You have to hike to get there. There's all these different factors in beaches. Is it warm water? Is it cold water? Is the water good for, you know, different activities? Can you mm -hmm. paddleboard? Um, and so I, I think somebody needs to make a, a book um, called Beaches of Brazil and just like, you know, give kind of a, a picture of Brazil or a picture of a, a beach and just kind of give like a point by point thing of, you know, maybe a hundred beaches of Brazil. What makes, what are they good for? Um, you know, so you can get the kind of experience you want because there's like five really famous beaches in Brazil, but um, uh, no, I, I, I like, I mean, Rio's a great place. The beaches are great there. Um, I think that that in Campeche is that Campeche Beach in uh, Florianopolis uh, or Santa Catarina Island in Brazil. That's that's a pretty amazing, cool beach. It, it, it gets really warm in the summer. Um, it's, it gets a little cooler in the winter, but it's uh, it's a cool beach if you want to just relax or if you want to like do you know, a little bit of surfing or getting in the water or just like hike around or chill. Um, it's a cool vibe, cool vibes kind of place too, I guess. I, I know nothing of Florianopolis other than the name. You spent time there. Yeah, Some yeah, I about a week there. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's it's so it's in southern Brazil. It's it's not really popular with American tourists yet, um, but uh, yeah, it's it's an amazing place in southern Brazil in the state of Santa Catarina, and uh, it's I think that it, it it's just like barely off like from the mainland. Um, so it's connected by a bridge, mm. um, and it's this large island. You can maybe drive around it in a day uh, by car, mm. uh, and it has some very crowded kind of busy beaches and with surfing and like that kind of stuff in the center and south parts, and it's got a little bit of a city on the middle of it, but then it has a lot of these wild beaches. Um, Mozambique Beach is, is one that's up on the coast, and it's um, it's – you drive to it and you know you park there and there's you know maybe 10 cars you'll, you'll have the other people there but it's pretty much to yourself and then up on the way north um i actually did an episode on, on florinopolis with a girl um luis cardoso she's a travel blogger from brazil but yeah up in the north there's a place called juda de internacional which is kind of more like kind of similar to what you get maybe in like miami kind of like a cool kind of party scene that kind of chic kind of crowd um and then there's more isolated beaches that you get a little more of the hippie vibe. And then uh, Campeche is a little more like the surfer kind of cool vibe, kind of a mix. Um, so you have you have a lot of different options to work with. And uh, it's a really cool island, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I've not – I've made several trips to Brazil, but they've been on the shorter end, leisure, or uh, uh, a few times business. Uh, there's a lot more, of course, I, I need to explore. I have been to Fernando de Noronha, which is – a a, uh, a treasured one by uh, many travelers here. It, it pops up on these lists like Traveler Century Club. And as I understand in Brazil's rankings for for pure nature, I mean, these are ice, ice, most of it's within a national park and, and totally 
undeveloped beach and, and then there's some developed uh, sm very small guest house areas as well but uh, in terms of how Brazilians see it I understand that that for sheer nature it, it always ranks very highly and in, in their estimation uh, I've been to uh, uh, what was it uh, Santiago there where <laughs> the beach is entirely the party scene so I think that 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 rubric that classification you're talking about of what to go there is is uh is important i've been to many of these in the world that are like you know the iconic beach uh what's the one in tasmania like spyglass or something that you know there's absolutely no facilities there so it's like it's really kind of miserable <laughs> oh really like you know to, i mean to treat it like you're you know i mean you're, you get wet and sandy and, and what do you do it so i love these these really iconic ones for hiking and the vistas but they're not what i would necessarily myself enjoy laying out a towel and, and doing it in the traditional beach way yeah, that that dealing with sand is it, it definitely could be an issue uh, in some in some places, uh, especially if, like you go shoes or barefoot or, or sandals um, logistics, you know, kind of figuring it out. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Yeah. Did, what was your Fernando de Noronha experience like? Was that a pretty good place? Oh, it's fantastic. And it's one that. Uh, for a long time when I had been monitoring it, it there, were, there had just been one airline and it was extraordinarily expensive to buy the tickets, plus the park fees are substantial when you get there. So it waited and then a second airline dropped prices down and I, I'm beginning to frequent flyer miles. So both Delta at that, at that time no longer had a partnership with Goal and then uh, JetBlue with Azul. So suddenly I could use my miles to get there. And so I headed right out there. It, uh, it is incredible the um, uh, the area within the park. Uh, you know, the the I, most distinctly popping into my mind are these beautiful yellow land crabs that you see, and and that. So it is these these incredible uh, preserved windswept beaches. Uh, it's a very chill place. I, I don't believe even to this day that there's any large scale tourist accommodation. It's small guest houses. Uh, there's no thumping music parties. It's it's primarily Brazilian visitors, uh, very much chilling out, and and I did enjoy it. And uh, I, I suppose if if there's a hack of of one way you could, uh, um, there's two permits actually. There's one to be on the island, and then one for the park itself. And you could you could choose your days of which you're going to be in the park and make that count uh, if you're uh, concerned about the costs, and then uh, spend a few days in and out of the park. And then the rest of the days on some of the beaches that are outside the park, closer to the accommodation. Yeah, it's it's a highly regulated um, island. Uh, just I know because when I was in Brazil, I think you cannot live there unless you you were born there or you have some kind of connection there. They don't allow people just to move there um, to avoid you know, overcrowding or whatever nature preservation. It used to be a military. There used to be a military base. I think there might still be a military base, but there used to, used to be a much larger military presence on the island um, you know, years ago. Uh, and uh, and you cannot use sunscreen on the island. Hmm. I, was, I was I was told maybe that's a recent thing. But I probably, I've, I've I've become myself more aware of, of these environmental issues uh, related to sunscreen. Uh, yeah, there was. Uh, I did. Uh, I have an upcoming episode on the uh, Chiloé Island, which is actually in southern Chile. Hmm. Yeah, it's kind of it's an off the beaten path, but kind of a very exotic, kind of cool place. It's known to Chileans very well, but it's um, it's right near the Lake District and these other Tierra del Fuego mm -hmm. kind of big places. But um, not many people go there quite yet. It's still more of a little bit off the beaten path. Um, and uh, anyways, it's a, it's a great episode. It's coming up, but um, uh, the, the lady that I interviewed. Um, she told me that you, we talked about Fernando de Neronia and she said, oh yeah, it's really famous because you cannot use sunscreen. Hmm. I was like, wow, of, of all the things, I never quite heard of that being <laughs> a big thing. <laughs> yeah, I believe it. It, it is a spectacular spot in the world. You mentioned Chile. I mean, Southern Chile, I've not been to at all. Uh, Patagonia, not at all. And they're, they're high in my list. I'm looking forward to that episode. I've, I've been interested in Robinson Crusoe Island, which is uh, uh, they also uh, access from Chile. It's it, it's farther west out in the ocean, and there's flights I had planned uh, two years in a row. I kept planning it, and it's only seasonal when when the accommodation and these little flights are open. And I just didn't 
didn't fit it in. And uh, this year, of course, has been disrupted in, in many expenses. Oh, but before people correct me, the, the one in Tasmania is Wine Glass Bay. I looked it up. <laughs> I, I got it confused. And we've got some some very persnickety geography followers here. So I will uh, <laughs> I uh, correct, correct myself before they can. But uh, yeah, it, it's... Is Robinson Crusoe, is that out? So it's out further past Easter Island? No, not that far. But in terms of uh, the one you mentioned, uh, which sounds like it's quite close to the mainland, uh, yeah. I'm trying to see. Uh, so Chico Island, yeah, it's just right down. Um, it's basically right alongside the coast, more or less. You take a ferry like 30 minutes to get to it. Um, it's a big island, but um, it's it's been a little bit off the beaten path Um for, for especially for Western like tourists coming from like the United States and Europe. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel overwhelmed with Patagonia and that lakes region. I mean, the, the whole region that uh, it just seems like you can't go wrong. So how do you? I feel the same way about New Zealand. Is like <laughs> an island on a larger scale. How do you pick what to do when everything's incredible? But uh, Robinson Crusoe, it looks like it's it, the Spanish name is Juan Fernandez, I, and uh, six hundred seventy kilometers off the coast of Chile, so a substantial dis distance uh, and quite. Quite remote. I've heard very good things about it uh, because of the cost, the limited small flights, and the complication of booking it. It is a very niche, very every passport stamp kind of kind of destination. Just you know, it's it's, it's not something you can even the flights all operate on a charter basis. So you have to find the local agents and figure out. And that's that's part of the fun for a number of these islands is is how they how they exist in their own economic world. And it'd almost be an interesting counter podcast to be interviewing islanders and how they interact uh, with the big countries around them and their their experiences because I've, I've always enjoyed on flights talking to people who are going back home because they took a shopping trip to miami or they uh visited family or you know all, all these different stories how how many of these they, they can seem isolated but yet the the population is much more fluid and the extended like think of the the saints the in saint helena how they have such an extensive Diaspora, particularly in South Africa and uh, and uh, in England. Yeah, yeah. I what you made me think of too is um, another one is Antarctica, um, I, which that would be probably it's an island technically, I guess. Mm -hmm. Although is a continent an island? I, I don't know if there's a. <laughs> I mean, I guess Australia that is an island, but also a continent. Can you technically? Anyway, yeah. that's that's a bigger question. <laughs> I got to brush up on that, but um. There was a guy when I was in Argentina in Ciudad del Este, um, right near um, the the Iguazu Falls, which is amazing. You know, it's a, it's a one of the big tourist sites. You know, in yeah. Latin America, um, you know, going there on a bus, you're kind of like with like very kind of backpack tours or very like locals, and then you get to this place and you kind of almost feels like you're in Disneyland. You get like all these like kind of middle class and upper class tourists that are coming with families and stuff like that, and it's just like. And of those spots, the kind of difference you, you, you and the tourist experience you get really changes quickly. But anyway, on the back, on the bus that I took down from Ciudad del Este, um, which is a big spot for buying electronics, um, it's it's a popular place for all kinds of like illicit trade and all that kind of stuff too. But <laughs> one reason people go there um, is because you can buy things without, you can skip the tariffs if you're buying like a, a cell phone or, or whatever, because it's right in between Brazil Argentina and then Paraguay. Mm -hmm. And they have this trade network set up going back hundreds of years um, with people you know, trading things. And anyway, this guy on the bus, he was an Argentine, Argentine dentist. Um, he was young, he's probably like maybe 25 or maybe 28 or something like that. And he was driving, taking the bus, this 12 hour bus trip from Ciudad del Este back to Buenos Aires. Um, round trip was probably like two or three days um, because he wanted to buy a laptop because he was in the Air Force and he was going to be stationed in the Argentine Argentine portion of Antarctica for a year. And he was stocking up on a few electronics um, to kind of get him through that next year of relative isolation in, um, in, in, in Antarctica. And the tariffs are just tremendously high in both Argentina and Brazil, if you want to mm -hmm. buy foreign products and electronics especially. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, Antarctica, that, that'd be an interesting one. I think, I think, yeah, I'd probably like to talk to someone who's maybe lived there if possible. And there's probably not that many people. Um, so I'm and there is in a, a sort of permanent population in the that Chilean town. 
Uh, so that, yeah, that that would be that would be the one to to find somebody who's maybe spent substantial time. At, uh, That's interesting. Yeah, I'll have to do that. I, yeah, those other like islands though in in the center of Atlantic. I know they're very popular with kind of the EPS crowd and the travel centric crowd. Um, wh oh, what's the one? I think you just mentioned it. Um, Saint Helena is mm -hmm. one. Just in the Kuna and Ascension. Yeah. Ascension Island, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I think I'll probably get to those at, at some point here. I'm uh, kind of working on the more a few basic kind of things. Get out there like some Mediterranean. Oh, we did an island based on Corsica. Um, I'm gonna do one on Sicily, um, Chiloé Island is one, and then what was another one I just did? I, for a moment, when you said get to those, I thought you were meaning casually traveling to them, but I, I realize you mean the episodes because uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I, the, the yeah. Tristan visit realizes it's never as straightforward as you might hope. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that that's correct actually. Uh, well, I was gonna ask you though, like when you're traveling now, I mean, if you're going to these more far off, far flung places. You're usually not paying for it, right? You're usually able to use points. Is that? Uh, yeah, to I mean, to to a degree. I mean, so, something like uh, Tristan is a special case. I mean, there's no flight there, but the flight can get me to uh, South Africa to pick up the uh, to pick up the the ship, for instance, uh, Christmas Island. That uh, that I was able to use points. Have you been to Tristan de Cunha? Yeah, yeah, I was on the. Uh, it was what the second to last sailing of the RMS St. Helena, and that was the last one to go to Tristan. And uh, how was long that? does that take, roughly? Uh, what is it? If you're leaving from Cape Town, is it what five days? Like I'm forgetting now. We did spend a little extra time going around uh, uh, Gough Island on the way, but I think it was was it either five or seven, and then. Um, um, for over two days, we couldn't land, couldn't land. The, fortunately, we had the uh, the royal governor of the territories on the on the, on the RMS and, and lots of other people that had determination to get there. And it was this big last one. So it, instead of spending two nights, uh, uh, we got down to the the final day. They ex they got approval to extend the day and uh, tried and finally got us on shore for a few hours. And uh, that was. I think I, being on the RMS, I realized this. I was glad to get on this this very end of this this incredible travel legacy in which I had gone much sooner. It was the the greatest education, mix of people, uh, experience, and um, well, so and now, hmm? so sorry to interrupt. How, how so? How is it like the, the mix of people, education? Just the people had a lot to teach you about stuff, or, or yeah, I mean there there were so many locals that were commuting for various reasons, yeah, and. And their stories, I mean, lifestyles so vastly different than mine. And then this this collection of, you know, like out of a, you know, like like out of a British sitcom, or, you know, a period piece of, uh, you know, a world famous uh, stamp collector of Philatelist that's on uh, BBC regularly because of the famous stamps there, the uh, uh, former chief executive of uh, what South Georgia and South Sandwich Islands. That's the title of the the, the head of those islands for the, the British territory. And there's all, all these interesting people that had become at some point in their life curious or fascinated by these islands. So you yeah. see that crowd along, along with the locals and, and how much they're, for Tristan less so, but for St. Helena, the opening of the airport, how much they're lifestyle was changing. The airport had opened at that point and I flew back on the flight and uh, you know how much it, everything was shifting. I mean, in one way, you know, medical care would be much more accessible in advanced medical care to get people off. But for others, I mean, this this was their vacation and their home, mm -hmm. their floating home of, of this, this transition sailing back to uh, St. Helena and, and just it, it really was this, this this incredible community and tradition. Well, what do you think it is with people and, and travel that, that really gets some people like really into travel? I mean, for me, it was just growing up as a kid. I didn't travel a whole lot, but I always just, it was during the Cold War. And I don't know, for some reason, I would just absorb things at, at school. And I would just, at, I would imagine, you know, what is it like in Russia? You know, what do the cars look like and what do the places look like and just walking around, what is that like? And I would just imagine what it was like there. And so for me, it's always just like this fascinating curiosity of like when you get to a new place, it's like, oh, 
this is what it looks like here. And this is how, you know, people are doing things and there's differences. I, I For me, that's what it is. And I, I don't know, but what is it you think that gets people kind of hooked on travel? Like, I, I don't yeah, I think there's uh, certainly the kind of travel we've been talking about is there's always a collector story. Like as a kid, you know, did you uh, yeah. did you did you need to have every one of the set? You know, you'll meet. So there's a little bit of, of that, and I. It, so there's this this planning organizational personality type, but there's also this. I don't know exactly how to describe it, but there's. And especially this year has put it when a lot of us have been travel not traveling at all or much less than we did. I mean, we realize how how tiring and stressful travel is. And you know, even for very experienced people, you're you're spending money, time, your body's out of sorts, your yeah, your uh, new experiences, all of this. And for a certain type of person, that is exciting. And like for yeah. another type of person, it's it's getting in a in a race car and, and flooring it and so many things. And does that does that moment of stress make you excited and happy and want to continue? Or is it not the moment of stress that, that makes you want to excited and continue? Is it something else in life? And I, I suppose every person has something in their life that might turn off other people, but to them is like, wow, this now I'm activated. And, and for me, I found it was, it was uh, when I arrive at immigration, whether that's off a plane or ever, even, even flying, I don't really care for flying. I don't, the experience is just a necessity to me, and, but it's when I hit that border, it's new, the, there's a different language on the sign, it's it's all unknown to that. I just, I'm addicted yeah. to it. Yeah, I, I, I really resonate a lot with what you're saying. It just, I, I can't think of how many trips I've gone on where getting ready for them, it's like, you know, I got work or I got other stuff to do and it's just like, oh my gosh, why am I doing all this stuff? It's like such a hassle, but then there's a moment where I'm, on the way or when I get there, I just, it all clicks in and I just, adrenaline kicks in and it's just like, let's do this. Like, yeah, I, <laughs> like w w it was worth it, you know? And it just, um, the energy just starts to carry me through that I didn't even know I had in a way um, before in the planning phase. I, 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 I'm not as big on the planning phase, I guess. I, I enjoy that part to some extent, um, getting a cool travel deal or, or something like that. Um, but but the details of the planning, I, I guess that does. I, I try not to get too bogged down in that. I I usually just ask a few people that have been there if I can. I do a little bit of internet searching. I get an idea. I get a sketch of what I'm doing, and then, um, you know, when when I'm there, I kind of will will usually change the plans or add on. I, I'll usually add on more stuff. I don't really change plans that drastically uh, unless it's a very open ended trip. But. But yeah, I, I think for some people it, it gets them excited, and I, I've seen it with other people when I'm even on a car trip. You know, they get going and they just get all stressed out and they get all tired, and they're like, "Oh, let's let's go back home." And I'm kind of like, "Yeah, let's let's go for another <laughs> let's go for another five days." <laughs> it was crazy once I did a trip like around the world where I, I, a co couple of coworkers um, we were trying to race around the world, like going or flying out within a 48 hour period. Mm. Um, non-stop flights um, to go from, I think it was Phoenix to London, London to Tokyo, Tokyo, back to LAX, and then LAX mm. to Phoenix. And I, I kid you not, after I got done with that non-stop, you know, 48 hour trip, I actually landed in LAX and I was, my body was almost saying, hey, let's do this again. Like I, I, had energy, <laughs> like I hadn't slept for like two days really, just other than just like very sporadic, like an hour or two here, there. But um, just something said like let's that was awesome let's let's do it again even though I, I was kind of exhausted and once I did sleep but uh, yeah I, I think you're right for some reason there's it's exciting exhilarating for some and not for everyone so. and I think a lot of people also the the way the travel industry markets and the kinds of trips that are easy for someone new to put together you know booking the package tour to an island booking the the package tour around Paris and, and France and these kind of things that they serve their purpose, but they're also, I, I, I don't think they're ways that many people are going to fall in love with travel because if you, if you talk to yeah very experienced travelers, what are the experiences that, that mean the most to them? I mean, you mentioned meeting this, this guy who took overnight buses to, to save taxes on, on a laptop before he's going to, you know, <laughs> an Antarctic base to live. I mean, that, you just almost, it's almost impossible to have those encounters 
on these package style trips. So you, and that's, I feel like if, if uh, any p particular traveler could just be, have that as their experience, just be plunked down somewhere unusual where they, they have these kind of meaningful encounters with, with locals, wherever that may be, that, that can get them on to travel in a way that, that those whirlwind package tours just, just can feel like a burden and you know, worthwhile perhaps, but, but just exhausting. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. I mean, those to some extent that like when I was traveling through South America a couple of times, um, like I mentioned, when I got to Iguazu Falls or a little bit to Machu Picchu, um, I, I went from kind of being around very kind of low key, kind of like interacting with mostly with local people. Um, not to really toot my own horn, but maybe it's just my personality. But when I got to these like, high higher density tourists you know kind of travelers where it's more like people that are just going to a place just to go to that iconic spot you know they're just going to iguazu falls and they want almost like a disneyland kind of level of safety and control like everything can be predictable um it, it kind of exhausted me a little bit because it's like you're just you're you're I don't know, you're kind of corralled around and everything is just so organized with like the lines, like waiting in line, you let wait in line a lot. And um, you meet interesting people everywhere. I mean, I, I chatted up with a little bit with people, but it it's almost like after a day or two, I really wanted to get away um, from that. That's, and I would imagine on EPS, that's probably at least many of the people um, kind of would fit into that. Um, also, I've noticed with like, there seems to be a common thread of people that are fascinated with like um, abandoned houses or abandoned buildings or other kind of things that are in decay. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, and yeah, I've seen a lot of the threads, at least people that are naming things that comes up a lot. And I, yeah, I've gotten very fascinated with that kind of stuff. I just, I love looking at stuff that's kind of been abandoned or, or relatively old and it hasn't been very visited. It, it just kind of you get these glimpses of the past with stuff that hasn't been touched as much mm -hmm. or hasn't been as constantly touched. Um, and I don't know, the imagination can just run wild looking at that stuff. But I, I yeah, that's that's something that I've definitely noticed. I've, I've gotten more into um, in, in recent years and just taking pictures of places and stuff like that. So, yeah, there's then I will recommend Ross Island and the Andaman and Nicobar Islands of India. That's Ross Island. The, the local guide called it the uh, the Anchor Wat of the British Raj, and uh, it's I think of oh, yeah. Anchor Wat grown over what was then the uh, this British administrative center, and uh, it's a fascinating place. And there's a number of islands, uh, by what Viper Island, where they uh, a different prison and executions. I mean different things. It's it's a fascinating place of history, a collection of different islands. But uh, Ross particularly stands out to me for that seeing these, these British buildings of a century ago overgrown by these, these incredible vines. And yeah. The, for, the forest like overtaking areas, I, that's just, I, there's all kinds of things in Brazil, like in the Amazon or de other places, because like the, the forest is quite aggressive in the grow in the tropical areas and it'll overgrow places quite quickly. And you get a lot of pictures of that, but it's fascinating. Well, I, I think I'm going to have to, yeah, yeah, you, you gave me an idea. I think we have to interview you for an episode on the Andaman Islands. Um, I'm, I confess I'm not an expert, but what I, what I would say actually for the Andamans is they've, they've had the, as I understand this tradition of Israelis that have finished their military service do right. the trips around the world and the Andamans, Havelock Island, uh, is like Ross and Viper. I don't believe anybody's allowed to spend the night there, but Havelock, as I understand, uh, that has been a very popular spot for years for these 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 uh, these guys to hang out right after their service. So maybe somebody that that spent a, a chunk of time there would, uh, would would be a good speaker on it. Uh, my my visit was only uh, a few days uh, tagged on to a a business trip where uh, you know. That still qualifies. I, I mean, hey, it's, yeah. My my wife always makes me send the 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 flight itineraries, and, and uh, that was one where she looked at and she said, "This makes no sense. Why do you why do you need to fly east from uh, Mumbai to Calcutta to Port Blair to get back to New York?" And I said, "Well, you got me. I, I gotta see this place." <laughs> Um, I, I just saw there's a comment on, um, you know, that is impressive though, actually, Stefan, because I think you're, 
you're doing these trips, um, Stefan, sorry, I, I know it's Stefan, mm -hmm. not Stefan, sorry. <laughs> but you do these trips where you go like from, you know, you're based in Seattle and then you'll take like, you know, whatever, travel 20, 30 hours to get to a place and then go back while, while maintaining, like you're not, or are, are, are you typically going to a place and then going to a few other places on a longer term, like a couple weeks or something, or are you just kind of going in and then going back to get to like one or two places? Yeah, I mean, I, I I worked for myself the past few years, which means it's harder for me to travel. But prior to that, is is corporate, and I was based in Asia for a decade, lived in China, and then the New York oh. another decade. And it was always, what can I fit in in the time I have? Can I take something on a business trip? Can I, I only have a few days? You know, what can what can I get an overnight flight in out of New York or an overnight train out of, uh, you know, Shanghai in China? That that means I can I can be there at dawn and uh, maximize it. So um, environmental impact, I mean, I have regrets about the amount of flying I've done, uh, but uh, you know, a lot of yeah. trips where I feel like uh, I really, I, a lot of my trips I, I think about in terms of, I'm viewing it like I'm in a movie rather than, than reading, say, a novel. And oh, how so? In that, I mean, I have very compressed time. And so I'm doing as much as I can of what I want to do in a very limited time. And, you know, it, it would be nice to have a novel on each place, you know, with all the, the meandering diversions and, and extra context. Uh, but when I only have those few days that, that a movie can be pretty darn good too. And, and um, yeah. you know, I'll, I'll go to a, a UNESCO or a, you know, world heritage site, an archaeological site, and I might only spend half an hour. And people say, "Oh, you got to spend half a day. You got to spend a day." And then, and so in that sense, I'm viewing it more like a movie that I'm there because I've got other other things I want to see and do. And it's to me, it's better to to have that brief, impactful visit than and seeing more of what I want to do than than lingering so long. And but other places I do take very much the time to linger. So it's. It's uh, you know, not not one or the other, but I don't I don't feel guilt about going, as I said, to a UNESCO site and staying for half an hour, an hour, if that. No, right. I feel. I, like, well, oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Oh, I, I think yeah, it gets back to like that whole like, does travel really get you exhilarated and excited and, and get the adrenaline going? Because I remember when I worked for the airline US Airways, there was a lot of people that were very much of the opposite mind that. If you go to a place, they would only go if you could spend, you know, five days in Rome or, or a week or two in Italy or something. And mm -hmm. what's the point of going to a place if you're only there for like a day or two or something? And in, in my mind, I, 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 I've i traveled, you know, two or three days just to spend like, you know, a couple days in a place. Um, some of my early trips were just like that. And uh, I think you can, you can, yeah, the flying sometimes is inconvenient, but you can pack so much into like even just four or five hours in a city, you know, if you're. Yeah, you arrive in a place, the train station or the bus station. Get out. You can see things. If it's a smaller city, you know, you can definitely see a lot of it. And um, I'd rather see it than not see it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've had layovers in a place like Frankfurt. Oh, I've got five hours. Oh, wonderful public transport. I can be in the city, walk around. I can sunbathe with the locals from the banks by the, uh, <laughs> by the riverside. I can see this, that, and the other, and and be back. And that is better than just hanging out in the in the terminal. Right, right, and and often it's like a prelude to like, well, you know, you, I got to get back to this place and spend another couple of days here next time I get a chance. Or like, you know what, I, I saw a couple hours of this. I think I'll put that down in the list a little bit. Um, you know, I think I think both both happen. Um, I think there's a comment. Or are we are we responding to these comments? Or oh, is sure. Yeah, our, our most loyal listener, Michael. He uh, he enjoyed uh, Chilo Island off uh, Puerto Chilo. in uh, Chile. So. So much I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's off Port Puerto Monta, yeah, which is um, you can fly in and, and and talk about that. And then there's the modern sculpture at the bus station in Florianopolis. Yeah, I, I'm not familiar with that, but it sounds cool. It sounds really cool. I've and uh, yeah. what's it? abandoned places, Detroit. Yeah, I love I love actually Detroit. I, I visited there only once for about four or five hours, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, Mike at No Go Zones. I I precisely loved exactly what you're talking about. I love seeing these abandoned buildings and um, even the, yeah, many parts of the United States you can see that. And I yeah, I find it fascinating. Um, Detroit also <laughs> another a very interesting place. I would like to spend more time there. Actually, it's uh, it was the basis of the the comic book The Crow, which became a movie. Ah. And, um, 
it's you got a lot of urban decay. Are you? From, you're from, it's kind of a darker, more intense movie. From the I, movie. I only know the the movie and the connection with the the tragic story around its filming. But, uh, Brent Brandon Lee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it it but it was a comic book originally, yeah. and it was based on all this um, kind of a rock star who kind of comes back to life and uh, hmm. tragic. But yeah, yeah. Anyways, it was uh, it was interesting. But yeah, it was based in Detroit, so all like the. Um, right in the midst of like 1970s, 1980s, urban decay and, and all that stuff that was going on. And the gang members in the movie are based on real life gang members that existed. Too. So a little bit of trivia for you. Right there. Yeah, I have to study up. I've, I've been to Ann Arbor a number of times for meetings, but I've never been in Detroit city proper. I, felt, I was actually planning a, a trip that would be different areas of, of Ohio and Michigan uh, for it was going to be this May that, that of course got, got pushed off. So there's a, uh, there's there's much I'll have to see about that. Uh, the, the the comic book tie-in might might get us a little bit off islands. I'm curious. You you mentioned you've been in multiple podcast projects. Uh, many of us probably think we're we have a podcast in us. You know, just like you think you have a screenplay in you or a novel in you. Talk right. about uh, talk about the experience of getting one going and doing it multiple times. Yeah. So the first one I started about five years ago and the idea was I, I just started listening to podcasts. I, I did radio in high school mm -hmm. and radio in the late nineties was consolidating like crazy. And um, my teacher was a very business savvy guy and he, he drilled it into us. He's like, you know, whatever you do with your life, make sure that you make money, you know, do things that make money and radio is not going to be a good future. And so I, um, I shifted away from that and got more into like, you know, just different um, business or other career trajectories. But um, radio, when podcasting came around, I figured like, oh, this is kind of something you can do. Um, it's like radio, but different. And uh, I just started interviewing people, people I knew that wrote a book or artists. Um, I liked interviewing people and uh, entrepreneurs, um, kind of blending all these different worlds that I you know, had an interest with, you know, music, um, mm -hmm. writing with book. I, I wrote my own book too. And and entrepreneurship and stuff like that. And so it was called the Mark Cast, which um, <laughs> I think is kind of a very ego kind of name. Which I think it'll work if you're like famous and you have a lot of things, but it sounds very, um, I think, presumptuous to call it if you're you know, only getting like 300 listens or something like that. Or <laughs> so it was, and, and it was very like, like people just didn't know where it was going. And it was these very long form interviews that went like up to two hours that I did with, um, actually a friend of mine from high school, he got pretty successful with, um, I don't know if you ever saw that time travel diet video about a guy coming back and, and like from the future. And he was telling people like, you know, don't eat any bread. Bread's bad for you. And then he came back and he's like, don't eat any steak. Steak is bad for you. Don't eat any eggs. Like, and it was always changing huh. as, you know, times changed, you know, from 1975 onward, like every uh -huh. five years, like a new thing. Uh -huh. uh, so he's a comedian, you know, done pretty successful. We talked for like almost three hours. And so it was like, it's just, I, I, I don't, unless people are very famous, it, they didn't seem to want to listen, you know, for multiple hours of, of stuff. And so editing it and doing all that was, it was a lot of work. And so I, um, uh, you know, I, I got more into professional pursuits that were taking up my time. And so I, I kind of stopped doing that after a while. But um, it, it was a great I learned a, I learned a ton doing that. And then, um, yeah, so that was called the Mark Cast. And that went for about three years. And you can still find the episodes online. Um, they're on Stitcher. They're on Apple Cast. And uh, some of them are, are, are pretty good episodes. You know, I'd, I'm sharing I'd the link in the show notes so everybody can check out. <laughs> I can do that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I also wrote a book actually um, about growing up. It, yeah, it's a little bit different than things, but I wrote a book about, you know, people talk about having a book in you. It's like if you write a book or you make a movie, it's like you, you show you have a movie in you. But if you do mm -hmm. that multiple times, it shows, you know, that you're actually a true writer or a film producer or whatever. Mm -hmm. so I'm still working on doing the second book. Um, mm -hmm. But the first one is called The Internet Revolution, um, A Generational Story. And it's about growing up in the 80s. Um, I, I describe it like you grow up in the 80s and the 90s when the internet still kind of sucked. Yeah. <laughs> and, but we all knew that it was going to be the future and it was going to change everything. But we had to live through that process of it, watching it slowly get better for a couple decades. And um, I think our internet arrived at some kind of maturity maybe in the last five, 10 years, more or less. 
we know what it's good for and what it's not good for. And we've kind of like, you know, smoothed it over, made it more socially acceptable and people have adapted to it. And um, so I go into all that kind of stuff in the book. And uh, yeah, I, I tell you, my writing a book is, is it's, it's fascinating if it's, um, you know, something you really care about. Um, you, you write a book that you're just kind of doing because you get you get paid to do it or doing something else. It's maybe it's still fun, but um, not quite as fun. I, I, I did do a ghostwriting project after that um, on the sport of pickleball. Oh. And um, it's it's a fast. Are you familiar with pickleball at all, the sport? I've heard a little bit about it, but not not any more than uh, those casual references. It So it was actually created near Seattle on Bainbridge Island in the 70s. Oh. And um, it became a sport that's grown rapidly, especially among older age people. But um, and it's it's played on tennis courts, right? But it's a uh, different paddle and ball. Is that that's yeah? And the court's a little bit smaller. Oh, okay. It is a dedicated court. I see. Yeah, and it's uh, it's grown a lot in like the last decade, and um, even a lot of younger people are playing it now too. Hmm. And uh, so I wrote a book on that, and I, I got paid to do that as a ghostwriting uh, project, and so. Um, that was a little different, a uh, little different thing. Oh, but what's it like to be a ghostwriter? I, I, I thought it was great. I mean, the, the, the guy, the coach I was working for, they were very, um, they're very much like like business kind of guys, and they kind of just let me, gave me full creative control. Hmm. Um, they they told me what to write about. We did like three or four interviews. Um, I got a good sense. I kind of made some ideas and suggestions of how we should organize the book. And I just kind of came up with some stuff that we should add. Um, but he gave me all the content and um, just kind of let me run with it. And uh, it's great. I mean, it's a book is a, it's a real ha hassle, like the last phases, but writing. What, what, are, what are about those phases? What's that? Oh, oh, the editing, the editing. And then, you know, you realize there's a lot of mistakes and you get other proofreaders and you're changing everything and you got to work with the book designer and the book editor and everybody has to be synced up. And it's, um, they, they say it's a lot like giving birth, but I don't, I, I don't know if that's, maybe that's an exaggeration. For uh, this about tips, lessons, strategies, and myths. Yeah. Yeah. That's I I guess it. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I had actually yeah. already, but as we started the talk, shared uh, Internet Revolution in the show notes, and I, I had just uh, a week or two ago watched Console Wars, a, uh, a CBS uh, on CBS All Access, a, a documentary about those console wars, and my my father wouldn't let me own any of those devices until my mother relented and, and let me sneak in a Game Boy. But it was, it was fascinating to revisit that time, as you said. The technology was rudimentary for, for the internet, for the video games. One of the funniest moments of the documentary is talking to this uh, the the marketing agency guy that, that Sega had hired, and he was total startup agency, had no other clients. They took him on because he just made this crazy, the, the, the famous uh, Sega shout and, and all this stuff. But he, he, was, he, he was talking about how that that blast processing, which was the the marketing around Sonic and the speed, and that he said it was entirely just a totally bogus marketing invention. But, but I still see articles. I was searching it to this day. They still say, "Oh, it was actually real." But <laughs> and I'm saying it was just total. They just said the marketing room. Oh, it's moving fast. We'll call it blast processing. And and every kid in America was saying, "I want blast processing." <laughs> <laughs> that that it, yeah, it just with those games like. It just kind of makes me wonder how much of that was just due to chance, because uh, I mean, like, there was a game on Nintendo called Bubble, Bubble Bobble, or Bubble Bobble. I forget the name, but um, it 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 just was made by this like really hardworking Japanese guy who just devoted you know eighty hours a week to making a game for like six months. He threw his life into it, and it became this huge success that nobody really predicted. Um, yeah. So it, it, it. Anyways. Yeah. Yeah. There's like there's a gaming chapter in the book actually about internet re revolution. There's um, gaming was a big part of it, and and I think really um, what happened with gaming is because like in the 80s, gaming was all about going to your friend's house and like gaming together. Yeah. Was, in the 70s, it was going to the arcade mm -hmm. with your friends. Then it was gaming in your home with friends. Then in the 90s, it was mostly gaming alone or gaming alone on a computer. Um, and then end of the 90s and the early 2000s, it was gaming maybe maybe alone or maybe with people, but you were gaming against other people 
all over the world um, in all different, you know, battle nets and different things like that. And then now I think we're gaming on our phones. We're playing against other people. It's very social now. Um, so it's like g gaming to me, it, it went from like in the 70s and 80s being quite social to being very non-social for a decade or two. And then now it's like become very social again and very interactive with people in real time. Like we can, you know, game all the place. So that's a very interesting trajectory. I think that says a lot about the internet, how it, the internet initially kind of pushed us apart from each other. Mm -hmm. But then really the power of the internet, once it really got going, it was Facebook. It was the social, you know, YouTube, other social media that really brought us together that you really, it's people and you know, getting people to interact. Cause that's, that's ultimately what people want to do is talk to other people and engage with other people. And um, the divide yeah, uh, together in the literal sense, if not always the figurative sense. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, exa exactly. Well, yeah, right now it's like through, uh, it's through these other mediums, like we're talking here and it, it's bring it, people want to be together, you know, through COVID and, and stuff like that. But it's um, yeah. right. Yeah. They're, they're, yeah. I guess it goes, there's all kinds of different ways it goes with that too. Yeah. Yeah, you've got me. You've got me back to memories in the '80s, going to my friend Andrew's house, where he was always so much better at video games than me. And and yeah. uh, you know, we'd we'd play Contra up, up, down, down, and uh, yes. I would be done very soon, and he would get all the way to the end. <laughs> that's that's in the book. That's up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right. Like everybody I know that played that game still remembers that passcode. Yeah, that made the game beatable. You know, without it, you, good luck. I mean, but. Yeah, and there was always there was always that kid who was like so good at like you know he knew how to like beat the levels and you always brought that kid over or the friend over and he would show you all these like secrets on the game and uh, it just anyway there was all kinds of uh, fun stuff and and yeah parents would limit how much kids could play the game for a while it was always a struggle but I, I don't know I, I don't know what parents do now but I assume it seems like they don't have many restrict most parents don't have many restrictions on gaming um, because it's not seen as like. A non-social thing. What's or that? The way to your kid becoming a billionaire, and anyway, the parents are on their own screens. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, and that's yeah, right. Exactly. The generation that was like really getting really into screen time as kids, you know, as the prior primary way of interacting, they're now adults now having kids, and so they don't. Th yeah, they have a different view of it than uh, than people. I mean, like my parents, they probably they came from a generation where the TV was still kind of a big change and. You know, I, I knew kids that grew up that like their parents grew up in places without a TV. And oh, we yeah. didn't have a TV for some years because it, it broke. And then my father said, it's, it's a waste of time. Keep reading. And it was uh, it was just uh, that's why I said I had to go to a friend's house to play. Gosh, I'm thinking back. He had these uh, piles of Nintendo Power magazine and it would always be these. They're like designated pros of, of their achievements. And one one month, one guy, his thing was he he could beat Ninja Gaiden blindfolded. And uh, you know, for people that haven't experienced the side scroller, to think about how it's even—I mean, it was a really hard game, but a side scroller, so it would always be the exact same way, so you could memorize it. But it was, you know, maybe he went on to find, you know, found some incredible startup, <laughs> or he's still playing it blindfolded and still beating it on an emulator. <laughs> yeah, I, there was definitely a moment I think after the first IPOs of like Netscape in '94, I think it was or '95 when um, parents started looking at, you know, their kids that were spending a lot of time gaming as like the future next millionaire or billionaire that can make a lot of things. And they started getting more encouraging, I think, of their kids spending more time on their computers because they're like, oh, okay, well, he's really into like the computer. It's like, okay, well maybe like by the late nineties, it's like, okay, yeah, yeah, let him get into the computer because, you know, that that that's a, you know, a future investment, you know, that you're really getting, um, I think, well, at least with many parents, I'm sure there's all kinds of exceptions, but it, it seemed like there was a there was a change in parenting that happened somewhere in there. Well, from Island to Pickleball, wonderful chatting with you. Thank you for joining us tonight. Yeah. <laughs> it's been fun. Island Travel Podcast. Um, yeah, shoot me an email though. Let me know what <laughs> islands people want to hear about. I, I would love to hear that. Yeah, um, feel free everybody in the comments to add. It's uh such a broad sweep, but it's just uh, National Geographic Society did weigh in. A continent is not an island. And Australia, the smallest continent, is three times the size of Greenland, and they are considered separate.
but there isn't actually a precise definition of continent is the footnote. So you can still interpret things how you will. <laughs> so wait, wait, is Australia is an island then? It's a continent, which is more than three times bigger than the largest island, which is Greenland. Okay, okay. But they're also saying there isn't really a, a firm way. It's just a an ex generally accepted concept rather than rather than a, a pure definition that <laughs> that uh, that we can all work from. So it's yeah, we know it when we see it, but maybe not. And we look forward to more episodes from the Island Travel Podcast. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on, Stefan. Stefan, this is